bunch of the trees are dead. So, you know, uh, it's still farming and Mother Nature, it's sort of similar to what Cliff said. Like, we're just, uh, only can influence certain things. So like when those frosts happen, I don't worry about it because I can't do anything about it. Lauren, what do you got? I agree with all that. Uh, the, 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 be open-minded. Uh, when we started slow and built from there, uh, I think keeping the investment costs down was a big thing for us. Uh, we just, and we did it slow over 20 years. We're still planting trees, uh, but very, going very slow each year, kind of adding new trees. Uh, but from that investment standpoint, not over investing too. I, uh, as I mentioned early on, we had lousy success with bare root grafted trees. If that was our experience, uh, I would avoid them. I don't know that there are many of those out there now. Uh, I think a lot of folks have shifted over. That was a big error for us. Uh, the third thing, I, my third first thing, right? <laughs> number one thing, uh, sound like a politician, right? How many number ones do you have? Uh, the, we protect our trees. Uh, we put tree protectors on. Uh, started it early on, lost a lot of trees to mother nature and wildlife, and I don't know what all gets them. Uh, some days, but we, we developed a system that worked for us, and that's kind of, I think, what folks have to learn, I think, along the way. For us, we use the Plantra uh, tree protector. Uh, use good heavy stakes, got long, uh, very good prevailing wind at our place, and uh, that has helped out. Our number one thing from a deer standpoint is not browsing for us or, you know, dilapidating our tree protectors, but it was rubbing. And, uh, yeah. you know, one good rub uh, at, in, a, in a buck can go through the orchard uh, about, get about half a dozen of them a night if he wants to, right? And they're done. So, you know, you lose a grafted tree that costs you 50, 60 bucks and gets expensive. So tree protectors work for that. We use a four foot high tree <coughs> protector for those and that has worked very well for us. One thing, four parts. Mark, what do you got? What's your one? <laughs> I was gonna say diversification uh, variety, but I Deer are the number one problem in our orchard, and I, a three D fence, a three dimensional fence, was the key to protecting three hundred trees. You can't put a cage around three hundred trees. So the, check it out online. It's just three strands of electric fence, three D. It's ninety percent effective, which is good enough. Mark, what do you got? Um, the most important thing for me was uh, keep the weeds suppressed and keep them mulched whether they're on sand or on uh, clay. I, uh, I was getting, after I, after I planted my uh, main orchard, I was getting about three to six inches of growth a year, and then I finally broke down and, and got rid of those weeds in the spring, put down cardboard, and then covered that with sheep manure. And uh, that year, they averaged about three feet of growth. And then the next year, I got three feet, another three feet, and the next year, I had flowers. So it just bang, bang, bang. But, if, there, if there's weeds close to those pawpaws, they can take forever to get going. Thanks, thanks thank you all for indulging me. Question over here? Yeah, I, specifically for our food, uh, we're from Michigan, so we're bumping up against the northern range. And so uh, you had said you have a few named varieties, but mostly seedlings. Uh, I'll give a little plug to Neil Peterson here. You know, a ripe Susquehanna is a thing of beauty. It's wonderful. I look forward to them for people that can grow them in Michigan. Just hopefully you guys could hear that. Basically, it's a Michigan-centric question about which, which is going to grow up there. No, that's great. That's why we're here. You know, there is varieties that ripen earlier. All of them don't ripen at the same time. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Yeah. So right. I'm looking for the experience of the guy in the north and see if there's ones that do it or don't work for them. I've had kind of bad luck with uh, I, I love the way Neil Peterson's Papa's taste. I've had them down in Kentucky, and they're great. Right. Uh, uh, Go to the festival, you'll you yeah. get some there. But uh, I have my grafted ones are Davis, uh, uh, Overlease, um, Sweet Virginia, Lynn's favorite. 
Uh, toll, toll gate, those are almost all from Corwin Davis, yeah. who, who lived uh, um, north of Marshall, Michigan. Tollgate won best Paul call last year. Austin Cliff had a tollgate. He grew outside. Where's he live? Outside Chicago somewhere, or he's northern in Illinois. Anyway. Yeah. So your your experience is similar to mine. Yeah. Yep. Stick to the Michigan variety. Question. Long hair. Yeah. Um, what's your? You probably have a name. Sorry, that was. Brendan, <laughs> <laughs> but hey, right? Um, what's your uh, minimum spacing in a production environment before the trees get overcrowded? Minimum spacing. I wish I'd made all mine 16 by 16, but I planted most of them on uh, 15 by 8, and they are getting crowded. That's why ours are planted at 15 by 8. Uh, mine are 18 by 8. Uh, and the 8s in the rows are starting to touch, but that's all right because some varieties actually need a little bit of shade uh, to prevent cracking. It, but it depends on your machinery. Yeah, we, we did most of ours on 15 uh, by 8. Uh, well, so and that's kind of what we've stuck with. I, I, we learned that uh, along the way, someplace along the way, and that seemed like a good spacing to us, and it's worked out pretty good. Uh, yeah. yeah, 15 for me, too. Uh, same. Well, hold on, you've already asked one. Who has the next question here once has a question? George? In the alleyways, I find a variety called No Mow Grass. It's a blend of fine fest. So my brother didn't have to mow it every month. It's real, real fine, dark green. It looks good. What was the name of the grass? No mo grass. No mo grass. N O M O. Yes. Interesting. Good, sir. When do you thin fruit? You have too many. Do you guys thin? We do not. Chris. Lauren. We've done a little bit, uh, and. Really, we've done them when they're just sort of, I don't know, I don't know what the right answer to this, but they're probably about an inch and a, inch, inch and a half at the longest. Uh, they seem to come off pretty nicely without disrupting the whole cluster. About the size of a golf ball, it's very important for fruit quality and size, yeah. Take it down to two to three per cluster. You do that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've done it uh, inconsistently, but uh, mostly with my grafted trees. Okay, great question. Sir? Yeah. We'll the, uh, then we'll get to you next, promise. In a very rural location, what type of equipment and infrastructure is needed to establish an orchard? A small scale. Chris lives in a very rural place. Like wells or electricity. What needs to be brought out there to, uh, to create something like this? <laughs> a shovel. A very rural area. <laughs> a, a set of post code diggers, <laughs> seedlings, and uh, your dirt. Yeah. Small solar panel because you're off the grid uh, to charge that electric fence. Yeah. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, what'd you say? Nothing. Nothing. We really don't have much. Okay. Uh, not in the orchard. I promise this gentleman here, you get to ask another question, and then I'll get to you, and then in the back. Yeah. So, uh, do you experience crop loss due to animals? And if so, what animals? And how do you? What are your defenses? What animals do they hate? Is basically the question. Ours right now, we have not lost much of anything to fruit, and I hope it stays that way, but I know some folks have had problems with raccoons, and uh, probably one of the, the bigger ones, Chris, you might, and where you're at, but we're kind of in an area where it's, we're, we've got a lot of woods around us, but it's where it hasn't been a big issue. Deer were the number one thing for us, uh, and uh, with the plant, with the tree protectors, or probably makes a lot of sense to use a, you know something around them, they, for us, it was the number one. Uh, they could rack up, half, you know, half a dozen trees a night. So, you know, lose a tree. So. What I'm about to say sounds strange, but you got to, you have to grow enough for them, and you to. <laughs> <laughs> we can stop right now without. <laughs> I mean, my my sort of annual visitor is possums. You know, like they just seem to come up out of the woods from, they just smell that fruit, you know. Um, but raccoons are up there. So do you do anything to defend against? I mean, unfortunately, I haven't figured out a way besides like trapping them or, you know, that's about it. I mean, cause like they go over fences. Uh, but the deer I use what Mark says, I use the three, you know, electric fence. It keeps the deer out, but not, not the possums. 
Any other comments on three, that? Three deep vents for deer and for raccoons. I actually, I use uh, traps in the periphery of my property, and you can do with them what you need to do. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got, uh, I can tell the difference between possum bite marks and coon bite marks on the, uh, on the fruit, because they'll, they'll take one taste and they'll go, and they'll go to the next tree. Uh, but I don't have any trouble with deer at all. Uh, so uh, I don't know. But they mess they mess my apples up. Show off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to hear about your experience of like time, motion, and harvest. Like, what do you feel is a good average for you uh, pounds per hour? Like, how how long does it take? So we're talking about harvesting. Go ahead, Sarah. I, I've done about 100 pounds in four hours. Oh. 100 pounds in four hours? But that was looking for cultivar specific also. Mark's orchard is set up with the cultivars in blocks, so that's mm -hmm. a lot easier to get cultivar specific. If you're running around an orchard for one tree and another tree and another tree, you're going to lessen that time. But if you can go through and feel, if you're feeling for everything, that's a different story. And I know Lauren goes out pretty much day <coughs> and knows which fruit's going to be ripe. So if you have that sense too, you would then get a little faster. Mm -hmm. Did I promise somebody in the back or did I take care of you guys? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I've how, how you pruned your trees over time and then kept them at reachable height or these ladders. Any comments on pruning? Uh, I've tried to keep the trees I like the best, I tried to keep them pruned down low enough so I could pick everything off the ground. Um, if, the, if the branch is bigger than my thumb, I find that they often they don't heal up. So I try to catch them when they're still small. The older I get, the shorter I like them. Uh, no matter, stop. Uh, but um, I find that pruning uh, can also add to your bottom line. If you do it uh, in February, uh, prune for cyan wood. Sign was getting to be an important product, um, but don't don't prune too much because some varieties actually like a little bit of shade on the fruit. Yeah, we've done we've done some pruning, uh, a few a handful of trees we've left sort of go for a natural experiment thing, uh, and that's kind of interesting. But the, as far as pruning goes, we do try and keep them about eight to ten about ten feet is what I'm shooting for. Uh, we're on a hillside, so it's a little hard to work off of ladders to pick fruit, and we try and pick them, uh, so we try and avoid them hitting the ground. We'll keep see how long that goes if, as I get older and older, uh, wanting to climb ladders less and less. So we'll see how that goes, but uh, I would say that the one thing about pruning and pawpaw is that I haven't found any good real information about how to go about it. Uh, it's one area that we need some work in, but you know, when you when you think about them, they, they, they ain't apples. You know what I mean? When you prune these things, they're they're uh, they're not heavily you know heavily branched trees with a lot of uh, wood to work with. Sometimes you take one branch off, and all of a sudden you're wow, what did I do? You know, and you think it's like a big chunk of the tree's gone real quick. So taking the small pieces, smaller, you know, getting them small before, it, like I said, you know, don't get a great big wood and cut because I don't even know what the damage will be to that. So we try and start early with them, uh, keep them pruned as we go along. But they're really, they ain't apples, I can tell you that. Uh, Chris, do you guys got any comments on pruning? I, I've not done a lot of pruning um, generally, but like I have all these trees die, so I've been cutting out the dead trees. That's primarily what I've been doing. We try to prune to about eight to 10 feet. Uh, primarily, we collect sign wood uh, January 1st through usually March the 1st, uh, but it's, it's two-tier. We're reducing the size of the tree and collecting the sign wood at the same time. Can I ask a question? Crows have any comments on pruning? Can, can I ask you a question on the panel, of the panel here? Do, yeah, if you're going to collect scion. Before, let's, before we get on scion, you guys have any comments on pruning before we go off of that topic? The only thing I can say is I don't think there's a lot of scientific information out there. Maybe Cook uh, Pomper has something in his, uh, in his uh, extension publications about pruning, but it's something that there's a lot of things we don't know very much about in terms of 
Papa and its physiology, the whole idea of alternate theory is another story. Uh, but uh, so it's work that's yet to be done. Yeah. So in case you guys didn't hear somebody will have the time and the money to do it. Yeah, yeah. so work yet to be done is essentially the comment. So Lauren, what's your question? I have a question. Uh, scion, collecting scion, you guys are collecting scion. What's the restrictions on that as far as uh, for the for the, the name varieties or the ones that are patented? Or uh, well, their sign was covered under the licensing agreement. So you, so you have to work out a, a situation where if you're selling sign, you have to pay license fees uh, for each stick. Is that how it's, I mean, it's individually worked out, though? Like, yeah. I'm curious. So I know yeah. you know, what do you do a lot of time? The agreement that we have with uh, uh, Neil Peterson is uh, Per stick, we pay a royalty for every stick that's sold. That's coming from us. But for the individual, there's not a restriction. Let's see, I think we got some new folks right down here in front. We'll get you. We have to ask about cold storage, whether it's refrigeration for fresh fruit or freezing for later processing. 36 degrees. Yeah, you, you probably want to get some cold storage. We just added refrigeration this year. Uh, we were fortunate in the past to be able to sell everything right away, so we're looking uh, a little more collection time now for increasing our production. So we just added refrigeration this year. Sarah may know better than I, but the Kentucky State stuff was you could extend the uh, shelf life for the whole fruit up to several weeks mm -hmm. right. from several days. One of the best investments I've ever made was to build an 8x10 cold storage room. Coolbot is a great so off-the-shelf refrigerator. It's, uh, it's run by a little gizmo. Uh, keep mine at 39 degrees uh, during the fruit season. Um, and also it's important during the winter to keep your nursery trees in there from freezing. Um, it's important to remember that uh, potted papa trees will die under 30 degrees. So it's a dual-purpose room. And during Thanksgiving, turkey goes in there too. <laughs> well, I sell most of my pawpaws right away, so I don't put them in cold storage. Other questions for Sam Frontier? Yeah, um, my thing is on how do you determine your harvest time, basically? On that, I mean, because you know a lot of people they just wait until they fall on the ground, but that doesn't seem like a good. Questions, Wendy, pick them. Feel <clears throat> when it gets soft, dear, uh, close to the neck. Sometimes you can sometimes you can see when they're getting ripe. Some of them go through a little bit of a skin change, but uh, usually I don't, I don't even bother until I see a few of them falling off the tree. I don't even bother looking. I've had on the same trees though that there could be two weeks different. That's right. On the That's same really tree. Uh, Neil Peterson uh, said something really great. He said uh, in answer to that question, he said it should fall into your hand. That's when it's ripe. <laughs> now. Um, Sarah will back me up on this. I've done a lot of experimenting with uh, netting under trees. That's kind of an extension of Neil's philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's ripe when it falls into the net. It's not on the ground. And uh, <coughs> depending on the netting, it's a thing of beauty. It's almost like an egg farm. And in the morning, when all the eggs are right there in that little under the cage, you go out there and all your, your beautiful fruit are gently falling into the net. When we looked at Ron Powell's data over eight years or whatever it was, he's sometimes, certain years, he's picking his first ones in late July and his last ones in early October. Right. Yeah, our variety, uh, with the nature of our, all the different varieties we have in the orchard, we found that, sure, there's a, we've extended the, the growing seed, or the, you know, the season of ripening quite a bit, so it all depends somewhat on the variety and the growing conditions, right? Uh, so we've run as late, as early, in, Worcester there is uh, the last week of August, and but other years it's like we're not. Last year we didn't start picking anything I think until mid September, uh, and then so it's very variable. But we're out every I go out every day uh, as long as it ain't raining. I'm out there and kind of uh, checking them out, and uh, and I agree with one thing. It'll turn off a pawpaw person or for trying to experience one for the first time is give them an unripe pawpaw. Uh, you're done. So. 
So Chris is going to answer this question. I've been with him for at least 10 years on the, on the Paw Paw Festival, and every other couple of years it's like, well, I hope they're going to be right by the time the festival starts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the variation of the season. A uh, drought year, you know, the fruit are going to fall off quicker. Um, and, you know, all the varieties. And then, you know, when I'm dealing with different spots, you know, you've got your, your uh, you know, topographical variations too. And, you know, like what I'm doing with the fruit. Like for me, I like to have the fruit that's ripe. And because when we're processing them, I really don't want anything that's underripe. And, but if I'm going to ship them, I don't want to ripe fruit. Because if you ship them, by the time they get there, they're a puddle of, you know, mess. So it depends on what you're doing. And, uh, you know, there was a question about how fast you can harvest them. Like if you're just picking them up off the ground and they're ripe, um, that's a lot faster than if you're picking them individually to ship, you know, obviously. In my experience with shipping is uh, orange slime, uh, <laughs> because if you pick an overripe fruit, what Chris was saying, you want a firm fruit. Uh, but uh, the feel by the neck has always worked well for us, if it's right. There is, however, uh, It was passed in Kentucky that you can't sell any fruit that's picked up off the ground, so you want to check with your state on that one. Can't sure that's. I was actually going to ask that because I know with apples and that you can't. You can't, can't sell them. You can. I didn't know if it was different. So, a quick little food science lesson here because that's what I do. So, um, pawpaw is what's called a climacteric fruit, which means it responds to ethylene. So, banana. You have green banana. You, you know, you know reliably how it's going to ripen over the next few days. And that's climactic response to ethylene. It's ripeness response to ethylene. And orange is not, right? So an orange is an orange. A week from now, it's an orange. Two weeks from now, it's an orange. I mean, it's slowly decaying, but that's what it is. So pawpaw, we know, is a climactic fruit. With a banana, you can pick it mature but not ripe and keep it away from ethylene and ship it and then, you know, bring it over to the big warehouse in here and flood it with ethylene. And it's in Athens, Ohio, two days later, and we're eating it a day after that. The window for when you can pick a pawpaw when it's underripe and when you can pick a pawpaw where it's already going on its climactic peak, you can't slow down its ripeness, it has to be seconds long. I mean, it has to be, like, it's there, right? But it literally, I mean, I don't know how long it is. And so that's one of the, like, sciencey things that if we can figure that one out, right? If we can, we can make it a day, then at least we could pick the fruit and ripen it later. Although, if Neil Pearson was in this room, he would say, quit messing around with pawpaw. It comes in when it comes in, comes in when it falls in your hand. We should eat it in September when it comes in and forget about all the rest of it. But anyway, so I'm a little, uh, you guys got questions on anybody over here? Because I've been, I've been, what do you got, young lady? So when you're dealing with bare root or seedlings and they're in a controlled environment, at what point or what height or age do you move them outside to find that you have a higher survival rate? You mean if you're on a greenhouse? Mm -hmm. So like actually just out in the open. <coughs> Well, so put them in the ground, or you ask them when you put them in the ground? Yeah, when, okay. when you, how old or how tall? Do you At two year old, they do not require shade. So you can take them out and plant them at that time. However, if you're taking them from a greenhouse that has a shade cloth on them, you want to slowly acclimate them outside before you plant them. And like Lauren said, all of our trees are planted with tree tubes. Ours, we, uh, we started our own seedlings just for our own, you know, plantings, and uh, we just grow them in the, right up behind the house. They're in the pots. I, I start my own seeds, and I've done, uh, we've actually done quite well with doing fall plantings. Uh, I know that's a, another one that folks uh, want to discuss, but. So what's your uh, timeline on? We do. When do you plant your seeds? And what we've done is, is plant the, start them in the spring. Start them so in the spring. We, we seed in the spring, and then. Uh, grow them through the first season, and then if I, I'll do some in the spring, uh, the following spring, uh, year-old seedlings, but then some of them will hold to the fall as well. But I've done a lot of fall planting and have had actually pretty good success doing uh, fall plantings. Uh, I, I, I think others have had different experiences with that one. But Is there some sciencey thing about fall plantings? Sorry about that. That we to know about? We, we planted all of our orchards and all of our woodlands in 
we have done some fall planting with, with students just as part of the <coughs> side projects, actually some of it just in the Chadwick Art Waiting behind here. Uh, we, we did some um, last year and, and the year before and we had uh, pretty good survival with the fall planting, but it was not what we wanted. Either of the marks want to comment on What's the question? Planning. What's the question? Fall planting? Fall planting or when you plant your seedlings or anything? I planted uh, some uh, pawpaws in the fall. Most of them I planted in the spring because I think it uh, gives the roots uh, all summer to uh, get, get reestablished after they're in the ground. Any comments, Mark? I, I have not had good luck with fall planting. I think it depends on your soil. It's interesting. I, I really can't figure out why some people have it working on the people. But uh, spring, spring's very good for me. I remember you. George? October 31st, I put my plantation at 100%. October 31st. Neil Peterson, different varieties. In the back? Uh, fertilizer. Do you fertilize what do you do when you do? Fertilizer? George, what do you got on fertilizer? I do. What do you do? Three times a year, 2020. 2020, 2020. How much? How much? How much? Two gallon jug with three tablespoons per jug. Oh, in water. Oh. Yeah. And I've taken leaf analysis, so I got the nutrient levels. And they're dark green all the way through the year. Bring a chair up for George. We're putting them up. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I, I only fertilized once in my orchard uh, when I put all that sheet manure on when I first put cardboard down. And after that rotted away, I began to. Uh, Look for moldy hay, or if I had to, I'd buy round bales of straw and uh, just roll that. Uh, and that also helped because the fruit will bounce off the straw. I use some guidelines from Kentucky State University on using pelleted. Um, you can use a triple 19. Um, I like to use something that's a little more um, acidic than that because I have some alkaline soils. Uh, in February, March, just before bud break around the tree works out to uh, actually uh, a couple of cups of, uh, say, a triple 19 uh, around, scattered around the drip line of the tree. Seems to work pretty well to get it started in the spring. Yeah, we've done something similar to that. We set the 12, 12, 12, uh, triple 12, and, but that hasn't even actually, we haven't done that consistently every year. We've, we've switched over to an organic fertilizer here uh, last year, so I'm going to see how that works out. But we also do, I, I don't know how all this stuff works out, but we heavily mulch. Uh, we use a lot of wood chips. I think we and, uh, we do the whole row, actually. It's just easier to do it. Uh, we let a lot of the, the very long tap-rooted weeds stay in that mulch and I think that has been beneficial to us. I don't know, we're working on all this kind of stuff, but uh, we also use a, uh, the, the, the rows themselves, the, the grass uh, is uh, mixed between some fescue and very heavy clover, uh, you know, with the hope that, you know, kind of nitrogen fixation is taking place there. So when we blow that into the windrows uh, when we mow, we mow usually every couple of weeks or so, let it grow up and then blow it. And that has worked out pretty well. He said we're about 20 some odd years into this, <coughs> and this, that's about our input right there. To uh, be honest, a little bit of fertilizers and then uh, mowing it. Chris, how big is your place that you have here? We've got like an acre. An acre. Okay. I mean, and I, I'm mostly organic. I don't use chemicals, so I mean, my major in sustainability. So, uh, but I've done variations of wood chip mulching. Uh, <coughs> grass, hay. Um, once I put some sheet compost down, some manure, like six inches thick, and I killed all the trees. <laughs> I was like, I found that limit, you know. Um, but, let's see, I had goats, and the goats don't eat the pawpaw trees, and they would fertilize the soil and do some of that. I'm a, like a low maintenance, uh, low input farmer as much as I can be. Uh, fertilization, we use one inch, uh, one pound of fertilizer per one inch of growth. That's the width of the tree. So if it's four inches wide, that's four pounds spread around the drip edge. Of course, if it's smaller than one inch, you also increment that pound as well. Sure, 10, 10, 10, or triple 19, any of that. 
usually in March and coming up on May here pretty soon, uh, we'll fertilize again. What do you guys do? Uh, 